For Bravo, take four, A mark. Set. Action! This is the behind the scenes story of the Barrow Freedom Fighter film. A truly historic film based on the life of the right excellent Errol Wharton Barrow, who led Barbados to independence in 1966 and became the first Prime Minister of Barbados. My name is Nadia Sarmova. My name is Mike Barnett. I'm, hi, I'm Mary of the Carter Narcisse. I'm uh, Director of Photography of the Arrow Barrel Project. I function as writer, director, and co producer of the Barrow Freedom Fighter film. My training um, spans um, over 11 years now, um, since I graduated from film school. Um, I have worked as an assistant director, as an assistant camera, um, for throughout the span of that time. I'm a graduate of Florida State University, um, as I've also attended UCLA. Um, my training and experience has been a, uh, has been uh, essential, um, but I think I've learned the most in the real world um, and actually being on film sets and I've been on countless film sets at this point and um, that has been the best experience and training for me. I was the sound mixer on uh, the Barrow Freedom Fighter project. Uh, I've been recording sound for about 40 years and kind of came up through the ranks. I've done a little bit of everything in the film business, including shooting, editing, work in lighting, but I, I do sound for a living, and I didn't really learn any of it in college. Uh, it was mostly through School of Hard Knocks and uh, learning it the hard way. And I am here excited to work on this Errol Barrow project with Marcia. Makeup hair, wardrobe producer. <laughs> As a department, costumes, makeup, and hair coupled with the right cinematography bring the director's vision to life. It's magical when it happens correctly. Our work only looks as good as it's lit. Film is such a collaborative effort. It's like a well-oiled machine. Every part of the machine needs to be working properly in order for that machine to perform. When you're doing a period piece of this nature, something that is historically correct and already documented, there's a certain amount of research that has to take place prior to shooting. From a visual standpoint, we, costume, makeup, and hair, have to make sure that what is on screen is relatable to the audience. So our work needs to accurately reflect what the period looks like as far as the clothes, belts, shoes, hats, gloves, jewelry, etc. Hairstyles have to be accurate and eyes and lips and nails must reflect the colors of the period. Why? Because that's what the audience identifies with. So we are a very critical and integral part of the film. I've been a cinematographer uh, for a number of years. I've done a lot of documentaries, a lot of feature films. I'm also a director cinematographer, also directed uh, many films. And so uh, I've been in the business about 30 years. So now as a photographer, so I was a photographer. I'm a son of a photographer, so I've actually been taking pictures since I've been 15 years old. So. So I've been involved in the visual aspects of photography for a long time. Well, I've been working in filmmaking for eight years. I have written and produced six feature-length films and directed seven. My research of this film spanned over a three-year period, at which time I wrote the script for Barrow Freedom Fighter. I found out in doing the research for this film that I really liked history, although in high school, I thought history was the most boring subject ever. But I must say, I totally enjoyed doing the research, which then made the writing possible. As director, I was responsible for creatively translating the film script into images on the screen. It is my job to develop a vision for the finished film and work directly with the director of photography on how to achieve it. Essentially, the role of the AED department, it's best to think of it as a spider web with the center of the spider web being the hub which transmits all the information to the other departments. So um, it's, it's a, a big job and can be 
timely and um, difficult at times when you don't have the right support staff, but it's also very rewarding because you're in charge of facilitating and helping other departments do their job. You know, my job was to basically uh, take interesting, interesting visuals of of this project in the interviews and also in the reenactments. So the real fun part, of course, of doing reenactments where you, you basically have a, a vintage kind of situation that you're trying to uh, explore visually and trying to achieve something that's interesting, you know, so that was the biggest challenge. Now, I work closely with the cinematographer and try to arrange with him to have a shot that I can get a microphone in somewhere. The challenges are great. Uh, one of the largest challenges that we had was when we were shooting the Prime Minister in his office. A hundred yards away or less were the trolleys out on the street and lots of honking horns and motorcycles and trucks. So there were numerous challenges in that respect everywhere. Uh, at Parliament uh, was a, a big boomy room. That was a challenge. Uh, not a lot you can do about that, but we got it as quiet as we could. Um, and just everywhere you go on this earth, there's noise. And unfortunately, I can't make it all go away. I think my greatest challenge was not having enough trained personnel to supervise each department, which would have given me more uninterrupted time with our lead actors. I was constantly doing three and four things simultaneously. So in the middle of applying Adrian's lace wig, out of the corner of my eye I would notice something and I would excuse myself from him to address what I could see. My head was constantly moving to keep an eye on what was going on around me. That, was make, that made it a little bit tough. My biggest challenge was uh, lack of time for proper pre-production, which essentially meant that we were doing pre-production and production simultaneously, um, and that made, made our time um, spent inefficient, and we ultimately, I think, cost us more time and money. The most creatively challenging scene for me was filming the first Barbados flag raising ceremony that occurred in 1966. We had to have special wardrobe for Mr. Johnstow and we could not get the uniform rented or purchased in Barbados or in London since that type of uniform was no longer being made or used. I'm happy to say that Helene Headley and Shimar Gallup both took up the challenge and produced John Stowe's uniform. Teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, I think for me, probably the most interesting thing that happened was being called to put down my AD hat and become an extra uh, for the bank scene. Um, we were short uh, a, a bank teller, and traditionally back in the 1960s, they used white, blonde, attractive girls, um, and they dressed them up. They weren't necessarily very well educated. Um, I think our head of makeup called them Eggy Beckys. Um, so they transformed me into an Eggy Becky, and I had a ball uh, just acting along with some of the extras and, and uh, calling the scene and then putting down my walkie and acting in the scene. And then once you know, the director called cut, then I would repeat cut and then put my AD hat back on. So it was fun. I enjoyed switching back and forth. I think the funniest story that happened with me was when Marcia sent me an email asking me what my dietary requirements were. And I responded, Mount Gay and breadfruit, because I had been there 20 years ago and I discovered Mount Gay and have become a aficionado of Mount Gay. And breadfruit, which you don't see much in the States. Uh, and I was able to get the Mount Gay readily. Wanted to go to the distillery, but didn't have time. And the breadfruit that I got down there was not to my liking. It was steamed, which is kind of bland. And I would rather have had it roasted like I had it before, which was the best thing I've ever put in my mouth. Funny stories, we have quite a few. First of all, 
my hairstylist and wardrobe assistant, Crystal Lachanar, agreed to come to Barbados. We had to get her a passport. Now she lives on the west coast of Florida and the passport office is in Miami, four or five hours away from her. We had to get Marcia to lock in an itinerary in order to get an emergency appointment at the passport office. We finally got that out of the way. I told her Barbados was a relatively flat island. She's thinking flat, flat with no hills, all right? Um, I neglected to say that we do have a few hills and some small winding roads. How was I supposed to know that she suffered from motion sickness? Well, every day was an event. She had to have her eclipse crackers and ginger ale to help control the motion sickness from St. James all the way to Codrington and College. It was a daily chuckle. Second, some of our costumes, when ordered, were shipped to my home address in South Florida and arrived right after I left for Barbados. Needless to say, we had to find a way to retrieve them and get them into Barbados. Thanks to a friend of a friend, we were able to get someone to fly up and bring them back to Barbados. I think we needed those because they were the dresses for the Supremes and some of the stuff for the gala. Thirdly, our biggest challenge was the challenge of getting our lead actor's outfit for the flag raising suit. Oh my god, what an ordeal that was. I don't think I will ever recuperate from now. The suit was custom made in LA by my brother Ian Card of IC Designs. FedEx gave him the wrong arrival information, so the suit would not have gotten to Barbados in time for that particular scene. So he shipped it to Miami with the hopes that we could find someone that was going into Barbados to hand carry the package. Well, that failed miserably. So it is now somewhere between 12 p.m. and 1 a.m. in the morning. I worked like 12, 14 hours that day. And I've called, text, Facebook, WhatsApp, every single person that I could think of to find someone who might know someone who can help me get that suit into BIM within a few hours. After being so frustrated, I finally posted an SOS in the Facebook group for the makeup school that I currently teach. And I posted, does anyone have a valid passport and can fly and get on a plane within a couple of hours to fly to Barbados? That was my last resort. In a couple of minutes, I started getting responses, many of which I had to quickly eliminate. Finally, finally, one of my former students said, yes, I have a valid passport. I'll do anything for you. I was like, oh my God. I called her immediately and then had her call Ian. We booked the ticket. The caveat was she had to be back in Florida in time to catch an 8 a.m. flight the next day. As long as she could get back to Florida in time, it wasn't a problem for her. Well, she lives in Port St. Lucie, which is a good two hours drive from Miami. The package was shipped from LA to the Ramada Hialeah. She arrived at the Ramada Hialeah at 7.30 a.m. I noticed that poor child didn't get any sleep. FedEx arrived five minutes after her at 7.35. She signed for the package, jumped in the hotel shuttle, and took the 10 a.m. flight from Miami to Barbados. Got off the plane, handed Dave the package with only 15 minutes to spare. She walked right back into the departure lounge, hopped back on the same flight she got on to fly back to Miami. We are problem solvers. That's what we do. I didn't get any sleep, but most important, we delivered. And that's, that's what it's about, delivering. What I loved most about being in Barbados was, um, was the people. Um, I met some fantastic people, um, just really beautiful souls, uh, followed by the food. Um, I loved uh, roti, which is this traditional, like, I think it's got roots in India, um, and I love Indian food, so it, it definitely um, pleased my palate. Um, and then, of course, the ocean, which unfortunately I didn't get a chance to spend much time at the ocean uh, because our schedule was just so hectic, but it's just, I did, I think, maybe a couple hours the entire three plus weeks we were there. And it was beautiful water, crystal blue, walk through it, see your feet, and uh, very warm and just lovely. Being able to go scuba diving in beautiful, pristine water. Uh, beach diving, it was just, just something I've never done before. But from a, from a professional standpoint, uh, it's, it's so beautiful, there's just so much beautiful architecture, there's so many opportunities to create interesting images that that's, that's probably what I love the most about it. You know? The thing I like most about Barbados, and I have from the first time I went there, are the people. 
the almost constant breeze, which is just really to my liking. That and Chefette. I really love the fact that the Barrow Freedom Fighter set was a teaching set. We had experienced film and acting personnel guiding and imparting valuable knowledge to those who were not as experienced. We had trainees in every department, makeup, craft services, wardrobe, hair, AD, camera, and sound department. Training actually started in the pre-production of the film and continued to post-production and marketing. In total, we are thrilled to announce that through the step-by-step -step film apprenticeship program, we have trained over 120 local persons in filmmaking over a period of nine months. We want to specifically thank the Human Resource Development and the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Culture for making this training aspect of the Errol Barrow Film Project a reality. Funding for this film, like most films in the Caribbean, can be very difficult to attain. However, we must make mention of our ultra-platinum sponsors, Goddard's Enterprises Limited and Quartz. There are many other companies and government entities which sponsored, and we want to say a very big thank you to them. We were able to complete the filming of Barrow Freedom Fighter. We work together using the very little resources that we have. We are thrilled to report that over 120 people were trained in filmmaking over the period and another 150 persons were employed in the Barbados film industry through the making of Barrow Freedom Fighter. Truly teamwork makes the dream work. Mr. Lee, it does seem on the face of it that you are indeed an idiot and cannot chair a meeting. What can you do for a man who is living at subsistence level after you have profited? I want to know what kind of mirror image do you have of yourself. This is what I am concerned about. We're the black workers in the small island of Barbados where I am from. One does not join a club if one cannot afford to pay the dues oneself. Do not wait until the end of the month. Close your offices and be out of Barbados in two days. He was resolute when he's making his decisions on behalf of the people of Barbados. He strongly believed that service to the country should not be financially driven. Politics for him was about duty. We were hoping that you could find a little something for either of us to do. Your yeah, constituency representative is out of Hopkins, right? It's about that piece of land in St. Lucie that belonged to my father. I am not signing this. What are you doing in my house at this hour of the morning? Errol Barrow was among the dominant figures in the political landscape of Barbados for more than two decades. Nobody has ever been revered in history for having become the richest man.